Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast all about board and card games and the people who play them. This episode, number 24, is part of our classic series and was originally aired on November 9, 2005. And now, here's your host, Tom Vassell. All right, it's great to be back another week. Now, you obviously have noticed this is not our weekly podcast. Things are pretty busy sometimes, but we wanted to not leave you with nothing this week. We'll get back to our regularly scheduled podcasts next week, but this is one of our old podcasts. As you heard in the intro, it's episode 24, which it's hard to believe was recorded five years ago. Five years we've been on the air, which I guess with a lot of different programs and TV shows and stuff, isn't meant maybe a long time, but in the life of a podcast, it really can be. Well, there's a couple things that we have for you here, and the first is we wanted to not keep this time sensitive, and so we have our conventional wisdom. Eric, what's going on? Now it's time for a little conventional wisdom, keeping you up to date on board gaming events near you. I got a couple coming up really soon, and one that's pretty far out, but I'm pretty excited about it. Let's start with Charcon in Charleston, West Virginia, October 22nd through the 24th, which Travis tells us about. It's a very active event with lots of new stuff going on this year, including a bar at the end of the universe, and of course, lots of games to play. Read all about it at charcon.org. Our own Jeff Engelstein will be at UberCon in Edison, New Jersey, November 5th through the 7th. In addition to board games, card games, RPGs, and LARPing, they have sessions for LAN computer gaming and a film festival. The website for more info is ubercon.com. Listener Bob Menzel will be at Carnage 13 in Fairleigh, Vermont, that same weekend, November 5th through the 7th. They have scheduled events for board games, card games, and RPGs, as well as an open wargaming room all weekend, and a Dominion tournament on Saturday. Look at the schedule at CarnageCon.com for more information. Last but not least, both Tom and I will be guests of honor at Total Confusion in Mansfield, Massachusetts, February 24th through the 27th. More details to come, but I just wanted to get the word out now. Read more about the event at TotalCon.com. Maybe we'll see you there. And you can tell us where you'll be by emailing us at TheDiceTower at gmail.com with the subject, Conventional Wisdom. Well, thanks, Eric. Before we get into this show, which, you know, I used to edit out some of the stuff from the show, like old contests and and such, but I, I just, I'm just leaving everything in now for posterity's sake. You can hear what our contests were like. But before we get into the show, I wanted to mention, if you're listening to the Dice Tower here, I urge you to go and listen to episode 184. 184 gives you the details of how to be involved in our secret Santa. Now, we have what, almost 200 people who've joined so far, and it's really exciting because we have over 100 prizes to hand out. And this has gotten even better. May Day Games is now giving us 10 packs of their Euro card sleeves, 10 packs of regular card sleeves, the green ones, uh, a copy of Space Junkyard, a copy of Hagoth, Builder of Ships. Both of those are games that May Day produces. Uh, one copy, this is really cool, of their premium Euro token box set. has 281 different pieces in. Most of these pieces are used for the game Agricola, but you can use them for other games like Settlers of Catan or basically anything that you can find. Little wooden things. I have them used in all my games. I really, really enjoy this. And this is a nice box set that holds all the pieces in it real well. They're also giving us a set of just the animals, a set of just the Euro tokens, a set of the wooden farmers, and a set of the wooden trains. This is a really cool thing. It comes with 350 wooden trains. And they're not just the engines, but it's the whole train. So you can use these in games like Steam, which comes with discs instead of trains. But you can also use it in Ticket to Ride and replace those plastic trains with these wooden trains. It's amazing. It's a it, it's a really neat addition. And so uh, we want to thank Mayday Games. Uh, but they're not the only ones. I want to remind you that we have quite a few people who are donating to this, including our sponsors, Fun Again Games, with two fifty dollars certificates. But North Star is giving us a copy of Wits and Wagers, Say Anything, and the family ex and the expansion versions of Wits and Wager, Summoner Wars. We got six copies of that. Uh, Days of Wonders giving us Mystery Express, 
Be Not Afraid, and their four fictionary packs, three copies of each. And Tasty Minstrel is giving us six copies of Terra Prime, which I recently was played and just really enjoyed. It really reminded me a lot of Starfarers of Catan, but maybe on a on a somewhat smaller scale, but a lot of fun. And then the very, very popular innovation. We didn't play test this at all. And six is from Asma D Games. So check these out. There's more games than that. We'll talk about them in the future. But I wanted to thank everybody who got involved in Secret Santa. If you're listening to this and you sent me an email talking about Secret Santa and I did not respond to you, then I did not get your email because I'm trying to respond to each person. Uh, when you send me your emails with the information and the information you need in episode 184, but when you send me these uh, emails, I put them and file them away and I'm going to be putting everything together, but I always send an email back to you just so you know, or maybe you've missed some information. Uh, this is going to continue to the first week of November or second week of November. I, I haven't made a hard cutoff date yet, but don't wait, don't delay. Email us as soon as possible, and then I'm going to email you out all the information that you'll need for the next stage, which is really, really exciting. And so we're really looking forward to this. And then at the end of the year, we'll announce the prizes. So there's lots of good stuff coming up. And I'm really excited about episode 186 and 187 all right, over the next two weeks. Some really interesting things. But I wanted to take a look here, as usual, back at one of our old podcasts. So here we go. Back to me and Joe Stedman, my co-host at the time. And let's see what we had to say. Dice Tower, episode 24. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about card games, war games, Euro games, miniatures, but most of all, board games. Your hosts are Tom Vassell, internet reviewer extraordinaire, and Joe Stedman, vocal war game enthusiast. More about the Dice Tower can be found on the web at www.thedicetower.com. And now, here's your hosts, Tom and Joe. All right, this is Tom Vassell. Welcome, welcome to the Dice Tower. Hello. <laughs> Well, okay, look, this is our 24th show, and in honor of our 25th show next week, we're going to have a, a different theme. Yes, amen, praise the Lord. So. <laughs> hey, I appreciated the, the professional sound of our new new theme. It was just two, two facts of life. It reminded me of the facts of life. You take okay. the good, you take the bad, you got the dice tower. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we are looking forward to our 25th show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as I look at the other, a lot of the other podcasts are on their 50th show, 60th show sometimes, but some of them are doing 15 epi- minute episodes and such. Yeah, right. We do our show. Well, we also have to coordinate to get our Plus show we, together. We do a show every week faithfully. None of this like taking three or four months off or whatever. Well, either way, <laughs> it is a... It, People want reliability. Well, then why are they listening to us? <laughs> well, I guess we have reliable opinions. There you go. We're always going to have the same basic opinion. Although there's some questions I can't wait to get to because this one guy is way off. Okay. But before we get to the guy who's way off, we do want to uh, thank you for listening. If you go to our website, www.thedicetower.com, you can find uh, archives of our all 24 shows so far. You can listen back. And if you would listen back and listen to episode 22 or 23, you would know that we are currently having a contest. Since we are... Uh, it's almost over. Show, yeah. Since we're a show that talks about board games, uh, we're giving one away. And when I say we, we're actually through the generosity of Days of Wonder. Right. They're giving away a copy of Memoir 44, which is a World War II war game. <laughs> Be careful. And that, <laughs> and also a copy of all three expansions: the Russian Army, their double-sided map with uh, snow and and sand on two sides, and then a terrain pack. So far, the initial reports and all three of them are good, and it's your chance to get the whole set. And so, Joe, tell them how they can win this prize. Sir, well, how you win this prize is simply by emailing us and uh, letting us know that you'd like to win it. And when you email us, we'll give you an entrance. But on top of that, right, we're going to do that? Is that no, no, no. no, I thought we'd just give them one entrance just for emailing us. I mean, isn't that fair? No, because we're picking the top. We're picking the top twenty. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, never mind. I'm 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 forgetting things. That's right. We're 
you're going to email us and tell us in a brief, or if you want to go long-winded, because we have people who have been very long-winded, tell us why you feel or for or against the fact of this statement, Memoir 44 is a simulation or Memoir 44 is not a simulation. Now, you can take the role of some people and tell us the whole de- definition out of the dictionary and try to prove it that way, or you can go with the heart of the meaning, like I would say you should. Well, either way. <laughs> Um, if, if you've never played Memoir 44 and you still want to enter, you still can. Just tell us what you think a simulation is. Yeah, just you don't have to talk about Memoir 44 if you don't want to. Joe's going to pick his top ten favorite entries. I'm going to pick my top ten favorite entries. Right. We're going to randomize and roll dice, Take and those one of those entries and, right. will win. Unless, so, unless you're like one person who said that he just wanted to tell us his opinion. He had no interest in the game because it wasn't a simulation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but so far we've had many entries, and we have had a few that I know I'm definitely going to pick, but there's still room yeah. for humor, for seriousness, for intellectualness. For Some people have sent us PDF files. Uh, some some people tried to – one guy so far tried to, to speak on both sides. He tried to tell us how it was a simulation, how it wasn't. I yeah, think he was he's a double-minded man's to, unstable in all to, his ways. To work both uh, sides of the coin there. But either way, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a great game regardless, and it's this is a really good – chance to win a uh, game plus three expansions yeah free sent to you so enter us by emailing us at the dice tower at gmail.com yep and tell us answer one of these questions is memoir 44 a simulation or tell us what a simulation is and make sure you explain your answer just don't write it is or it isn't well they could do that but we'll never pick you right so uh this contest ends in one week actually a little bit less than a week since we have to go through the answers it ends on november the morning of november 15th Mm-hmm. And Eastern Standard Time at some variable point that morning. So don't wait till the last second. There's still six days left for you to turn in your entries, so you have plenty of time. We we see we, yeah, we say Eastern Standard Time, even though if you don't realize this, Tom and I both live in South Korea. Yeah, so, so we don't talk. You know, we take for granted most people will know that, but I guess not everyone would know that if you just happen to be tuning in. Found a podcast on. So we should we quick give a two minute history. I'm Tom Vassell and this is just them and we're both missionary slash teachers in South Korea yep. and who happen to like board games. Yep. So we do a podcast. We yep. talk about board games, yep. board games, and board games. Yep. And there you go. <laughs> that was pretty good, Tom. <laughs> so we're anyway. both we're both married. We both have three kids and pregnant wives. There you go. So we go. We're in a competition. But no. <laughs> well, no, we're not going to start that all up again. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, we'll have another contest for you next week. It's a game that's not a war game, and I would say that it's probably not a Euro game either. No, it's going to be, uh, it, which brings up something I was talking to you about today. How I want to try to, cat- I want to make ten golden categories, but that's right. So, do you want to ask our audience for help on that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, what what we're trying to do is we're trying to make definitive categories for games. Now, of course. Everyone's going to argue. Everyone's going to argue over me. <laughs> but you know what? It, even if only I use it, you know, I don't care. So I think this is going to be our, our, our top ten list for next week, right? Yeah. Uh, except it won't be top ten. It will just be our ten categories of games, how we would split them up. Right, how we would split them up, and then we'll then we'll both pick our favorite game from each category. So if you want to send us your ideas, I, I at least I'll look at them, and I'm sure Joe will too. Right. And, and that, will, that will help me formulate my and ideas. Tom and I will hammer it out, and then we can come up with it. Come it, up with. it may be that we may have more or less than ten. I don't, if I get 11 categories, well, I'm going to smush two like together. Monster games will be one of my categories for sure. Okay, well, we'll see. Well, we'll, right. This should be interesting. Auction games. Look forward games or in, our, in our next episode, which is episode 25, which is a good episode because we'll be handing out memoir and its expansions, and we'll be announcing another contest. And we'll have a new introduction song. <laughs> and, and a couple new clips, too. Oh, yeah, so there you go. For people who like the clips, they are coming back, and we'll see what's happening up there. Now, some people, several people have asked us to do a simultaneous review. Yes. So we're, we're, we're not actually going to do that, but we're going to... We're going to get as close as we can. We picked... Tom and I found a game that there's two versions of that's actually considered a Euro game, I guess, but one version is more to Tom's liking, one version is more to my liking, and so we're just going to do a simultaneous review. And the game is actually designed by the author of probably the most pop, one of the most popular games in the world, Settlers of Catan. The author is Klaus Tuber, but the board games are produced by two totally different companies. The first one, Lowenhertz, was produced originally by Gold Sieber, and in America it was picked up by Rio Grande Games. The uh, domain, I'm not sure who published it first, but it's currently published in America by Mayfair Games. Right, so Lowenhertz and Domain. Oh, I'm sorry, it was, it, was, it was originally published by Cosmos. Right. And So two, two different German companies and two different uh, American companies. So in a nutshell, 
the Lone Hertz is the the manly one, and uh, Domain is the girly one. So Dom- <laughs> Lone Hertz came out many several years before Domain did. Domain is is a recent game. Domain is actually still in print. While Lowen Hertz, to my knowledge, is not in No, print. it's not. You have to pick this one off eBay or However, trade However, Hertz is not a difficult game to get. It's, you know, it's often I would over- say it's mid-range. Yeah, I think it's often overlooked just because Domain. I think when Domain came out, it was much easier to find a copy of Lowen Hertz because people were trading it off, and I think that's a mistake. We're going to give you the, the, the general gist of the games, but before we do that, I want to compare the components. And I know that Joe may argue a little bit about this, but I'm, I'm going to say Domain wins in components quality because the, mostly because it's newer. It's brand new, and the board just looks a whole lot prettier. The Lowenhurst board is functional, but it's a little bland. Mm. The, but I guess sometimes bland may be better not, for some it, people. Although I, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm kind of stuck with the, the knights. The knights in Lowenhurst are little shield crests with a sword. The knights with you guys aren't they like little knights, like on a horse or something? Yeah, they're on a horse. You right. don't like the, I'm on a I'm horse. I'm not better. sure. I, I thought the knight, the, the shield crest was kind of cool. I definitely like the domain box better because the domain box is, is your typical. Square box that most Euro games come in of the large size, while the Low and Hertz box is a rectangle in, is in the Gold Seeper size, which matches no other size boxes that any other companies makes. <laughs> I, You're I, such a, a weirdo. Who cares what size the box? Well, is? It, it's just a big box, and it just it, it's a little clunky. But that's just so, I, I it wouldn't stop me from getting either game. The the difference in component quality. Um, although I, I I will say I like Low and Hertz's walls better. Yeah. Domain's walls are a straight line with one big bump, while Lowenhurst's look more like a, a castle. A little ramparts or something. Ram- ramparts, and so that's, they're just a little cooler, I think. Mm-hmm. Now, that's the components. And then, uh, yeah, so anyway, keep going. Now, in gameplay, each player, in each, in each game, players are trying to build different kingdoms across the board. Right. By using these walls. You're trying to wall in your kingdom, and you're trying to have as big of a kingdom as possible, because... The, the, as many spaces as you have in your kingdom, you'll get points. Right. In Lowenhurst, there's a set number of points depending on how many uh, spaces you have, while in Domain, for every plane space that you have, you get a point. Also, there's uh, cities that you, that you can try and, and villages that you can try and get in your kingdom that will get you more points. And so you're trying to expand your kingdom and make it as big as possible and while... Smushing the other kingdoms. And there's of the mine, there's mine, mines too that you can get inside of your. Right. Um, the in both games, it's a very very tight tight board. You really feel smushed because you have, if you're playing with uh, four players, I uh, believe that you each have three. Yeah, you each have three different castles, three different kingdoms. So there's twelve total kingdoms on a on a fairly small board, sixteen by sixteen squares. Right. Well, and the, the game starts off fairly. Fairly nice. I mean, you, at first you, you you don't realize how tight it's going to be. Then maybe two or three turns of the game, you're already butting, you're already butting up against other kingdoms, and that's where the conflict starts. Right, and it, it is a pretty neat game in in how you place the walls. Because if you concentrate too much on one kingdom, your other two kingdoms are just going to be small. And if you try and take a big kingdom in the middle, the chance of it being attacked by other kingdoms is larger. Both games are. F- Fairly vicious. I won't say extremely vicious. Lone Hertz is definitely more vicious. Yes. The reason Lone Hertz is more vicious is because at the beginning of each round, in Lone Hertz, there's an auction. There is no auctions in Domain. In, in Domain, you simply play a card and then you draw a card. Which and is this, this and is to ex- play a card in Domain, you have to pay a certain amount right. of money. This is exactly why I don't. This is this is the main reason why I would always choose Lone Hertz over Domain. Is because of this very thing. Because Domain to me is just your typical Euro style game where everyone does their own thing. And there's the, the, while there is conflict in Domain more so than in a lot of Euro games. This. Well, that was loud. Okay. <laughs> a car outside just honked the horn. Anyway, so. Uh, yeah, in, in Domain, there is some conflict, but not nearly as much as in uh, Low and Hertz. And, and I will agree that I think that the auction in the, is, is the main difference between the games, that the person, that the reason I like Domain better is because it does not have the auction. As much as I do like auctions, I just think it flows a little bit better in Domain. But let me it's not say this before going further. I, I think that Low and Hertz is a fine, fine game. Yeah, and actually, Tom liked it quite a bit until Domain came around. It's 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 only a minor preference thing, really, for me. It's it's I, I'll play either one. If I had to play one over the other, I'd, I'd pick Domain. Although, I wouldn't mind playing Low and Hertz. 
Now, it's, it's not a pure auction per se. What happens is there's three different actions uh, that you can choose from. And so right, you turn over the top card. Right, and, and then the first, player, the first player chooses what he wants, and this goes to the second player or third player. And it, there could be the potential with a three-player game of no conflict. But if two players want the same action, whether that be expand your kingdom or make your knights stronger or get more money, then the two players have to go into a negotiation phase. And they basically argue with each other and trying to make a deal. If they can't make a deal, then it goes into a duel. And the way the duel works is you both secretly uh, bid cards. Money cards, which money, you have yeah, at the beginning of the game. Which you have money cards. And there's no change in this game. So you, there's some of the money cards will say five, some will say six, seven, whatever. And then you bid these cards. And then when you flip the cards over, the person who bid the most wins. The other player or players, if there's multiple players in a draw, they get to keep their cards, but they don't get the action. So it, 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 it can be pretty vicious, then how much you're willing to bid. True. I usually try to get a negotiation. I won't take the action if you'll give me some money. Right. And, that, and that, so the person doesn't get the action if they're smart can get at least some money out of it. Right. Unless the other person refuses to negotiate. Which has happened. <laughs> right. <laughs> Domain, you, you, on, on your turn, you play a card to take the action on the card or you discard a card face up to sell the card to give you more money to take other uh, actions. It's a mechanic that's used in several other games, most recently Go West. Um, I but th- I, I think it works fine. I think people might be having a hard time if they've never played either game, kind of understanding the whole gist of the game, though. I mean, to me, just kind of picture it like you have different, I know this sounds really simplistic, but just think of it as you have different blobs on a map, and you're, you're trying to make your blob bigger and bigger and trying to expand more and more victory point areas. And you get your, bob, your blob bigger and bigger by enforcing it with knights. And the knights make your blob stronger so that you can push the neighboring blob and make it smaller. And, then, and so that's how you win. Right. Initially, you're playing actions more. Mostly, most of the actions in the beginning of the game, you're just placing walls down to form your kingdom. Right. Once your kingdom is formed, which means you have like walls completely yeah. around it, the, the border of the map counts as a wall. Then you can play other cards that let you push, push two against. spaces into another kingdom. Right, but you can only push into someone else's kingdom if your kingdom has more knights in it than the opposing kingdom. If it's a tie, then they just push each other and nothing happens. Other actions let you put knights into your kingdom or even... Nastier ones let you steal a knight from another. Which there are cards that you can get in the political within the card phase that you can play that will do that. You can steal knights. You can you can force one of the funny cards is you can force a peace agreement with an opponent, which is really evil because those two those two kingdoms on that corner there or where they're touching is permanently at peace unless you play another card to cancel that. I don't. I don't. It can't be canceled. Oh, that's right. It can't be canceled. That's For the rest right. of the game, you're at peace. For those two and, kingdoms. And that's no. how the last time we played Domain, I was really able to pull off a sweet victory because I had the right set of cards. With I was playing with Tom and some other guys, and I was able to make a couple of alliances, boom, boom, and then there was, there was nothing they could do because they couldn't even attack me. And it was just really nice. In that aspect, the games are, are, are almost identical. They're, they're both very vicious. You're, you're attacking other people. You can't play your own little game in this one. You have to. Yeah. You have to hurt someone else. So this is why this is a game that I can endorse wholeheartedly. It's, it's certainly... Very different from his Settlers games. Tuber <laughs> definitely did a different yeah, job. Yeah, I would never have guessed that Claus Tuber made this game. So I will highly recommend both Lone Hertz and Domain. If you can pick up either one, yeah, go I ahead and do so. Right, like I said, if you, if you can't find Lone Hertz, get Domain. But if you can find Lone Hertz, pick it up, look on eBay, trade it with someone. I would be, I would even say buy Domain and then list it for a trade for someone with Lone Hertz. <laughs> Don't even leave it in a shrink wrap and just trade with someone else who has Lone Hertz. And I think that you'll well, be- just think about it. If, if if you think the auction sounds interesting or not, and the simultaneous of selections, like for example, one of the selections lets you take money, and if you if more than one person picks that selection, you split the money. Mm-hmm. Which it's just, it's just a really interesting game. I like it a lot. Um, I like both of them. I don't think you need to own both. Even if no, it, I would. Say, I like right. both of them, but I don't. I would, they're I would redundant agree. enough to, to. If I really want to play Lone Hertz, I'll just play Joe's. And right. if he really wants to play Domain, he'll play mine. I would say so. that if if you find yourself agreeing more with Tom, take Domain. If you feel yourself more agreeing with me, take Lone Hertz. I mean, this just kind of symbolizes our personalities, I guess. So those are that's our review for this week. Domain slash Lone Hertz. Good. That was simple. Maybe we'll do that again sometime. Yeah. Uh, next week was it the Third Reich? Yeah, the Third Reich as compared to uh, Puerto Rico. All right, we have some questions as the third, normal. What, the Third Reich, what is exactly is that? I don't know, I just made up a name. <laughs> okay. The R- Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, are you talking about? If you have questions for our show, email us at thedicetower at gmail.com, and we will uh, try to answer them on our show. And 
we have we actually had a couple questions this show that if you're not hearing your question, we may answer near the end of the show when we talk right. about our top ten list. Now, now, let me put a little plug in for Tom. You Euro gamers need to. I guess the war gamer is just more prolific because the Euro gamers you need to send some more questions into Tom because Tom's just feeling lonely. I keep on getting war game questions, but Tom, you know. If, well, the, 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 I guess he's just not as first one here. Go ask me the first well, one. Well, then again, I guess maybe everyone knows your opinions about everything because they're all over the Internet. That must be what it is. Go ahead and ask me the first question. <laughs> all right. The one from Ninja Bob? Yeah. All right. Ninja Bob, yeah, that's his nickname. He says, do you have to justify using board games in your classes to anyone, like the administration or parents? And if so, what rationale do you use? Then I'll just continue to answer everything at once. Or do you only play them at lunch or after school? Do you play any simulations? And he says, don't get me started on memoir, ha ha, uh, type games. And part of your social studies, I guess that would be towards me and you because we both teach social studies. And he says he's interested in our views since he uh, finds that many American parents find out that if you play board games at school, you're basically wasting your time. All right. First of all, at least in our school, the administration is pretty, pretty open to any kind of innovative ideas for teaching. Yeah, they're, they're very, non, very non-traditional things is, is a big thing nowadays. And so I haven't ever had a problem doing that. In fact, they joke a lot of times, it's the board game class, Tom's class. But really, I don't even use them that much in class. I use them in my board game club, and I use them in class at maybe at the end of every chapter in geometry. I'll take a day and we'll just play board games. And I justify it by saying that it works, it builds your brain up. And I can't imagine that writing any kind of page of terms is more useful than playing an interactive mentally stimulating board game as far as like just generic terms or terms that are specific to their what even, they're learning. even even terms that are specific to what they're learning that, that that's good and all and i know i don't want to get a big educational debate but i think that <laughs> playing a board game mentally stimulates you as much as sitting there listening to a, a lecture uh, that would definitely disagree <laughs> but i guess that's my right <laughs> so you're saying that you could sit there and play puerto rico and then i can sit here and give a lecture on Puerto Rico, and you would learn just as much about Puerto Rico and, and the okay. and slavery in Puerto Rico as what, what, was composed. What of. I'm saying is, it's okay to take a break and do these, and I think the kids won't. I don't think their education is hurt. I okay. think that well, their that, brains that, that, that are sounds, building. That sounds a little better. What about uh, the other part of his question, where he said, "Well, um, you play them at, uh, We never play them at lunch because we have too short of a lunch." Yes, yeah, so we have. <laughs> we, we only have 25 minutes lunch or 20 minute lunch. Yeah, so I'm just trying to eat. Yeah, we we, we and Tom we scarf our. <laughs> and food and I'm not going to ever encourage kids not to eat because I think eating's important. Tom but and I, yeah, with Tom and I, we sit in the cafeteria at lunch with all the students and we yell at them when we eat, so it's kind of fun. <laughs> all right, simulation. Do you ever play a simulation in class? Well, I guess it's for Joe first. I, I have. I've played... Well, simulations is a tough word. I, I just, have you played a game in class? I, I have. I play, I play basically... There's three games that I play in class, class every year in U.S. history. I always play Diplomacy, and I play that with World History, too. Diplomacy teaches the kids great things about World War One and just about world politics. I, I love that game. Um, I, uh, House Divided, I use in the Civil War to show the Civil War just real briefly. And I use Axis and Allies just to show them World War Two because it's really cheesy and gamey, but it kind of gives the idea of some of the... It, 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 familiar, it familiarizes the kids with a little bit of the geography and what was going on. So that's I just do that for fun. But I don't do it nearly as much as Tom does. Play games, that is. No, that's true. Um, I've, 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 I've really kind of made that my shtick, <laughs> in, in a sense. All right. Um, but one one more thing that we do do and is is diplomacy. And you yeah. mentioned that. I, I I I use it too. That's probably the only game I use. And you can. There's so many ways to justify diplomacy. It's, I it's do not play even diplomacy. I, I play an ongoing diplomacy game every year, and I, I actually call it the Royal Rumble. This I'm actually on Royal Rumble number four this year. And what I'll do is I'll have each class. I, I teach five periods. Uh, I have each class um, be a period or be a, be a country, then the two large classes, I split them into guys and girls, and then I'll have a guys team and girls team, so it's a total of seven teams, and uh, during the course of the semester, every Friday a turn is due, and uh, I don't talk about it in class, except for on Friday, I may spend 20 minutes on it towards the end of class, and I educate their moves and everything, and the kids get mad, and the winner will get a pizza party for their class, and uh, maybe uh, some kind of quiz grade or something, but it's it's the kids really like it, and the first year I taught it, they were a little bit, they were a little, uh, they didn't know what to think, but by the second year I p- taught it, the kids had heard about the, from the first year and are all ready to play and excited to play. And the kids really get into it. They do research on the diplomacy archives and everything. They got some pretty good strategies at times. And real quick, this is a question for people who are out there. Joe and I were just discussing uh, a week or so ago about a simulation. Actually, running a simulation at Origins, there was a, a simulation where they simulated uh, where a bunch of people were in the cabinet and they were in the 
office and nuclear war struck. And yeah. if you have any kind of resources where we could run something like that with the kids, I think it would be a lot of fun for yeah. them. Well, tell, well, let's, let's tell the people what we and you got going on and see if anyone's got a good idea what we could do. Tom and I are actually going to be in charge of a group of teenagers all night long here coming up soon. I think there will be about 25 of them. About 25 teenagers that are high school aged, uh, like ninth grade and above, and we can do anything we want with them and they'll do whatever we tell. So we, we're thinking about playing some kind of role-playing game or some kind of thing where we can have fun with them. And So we're looking for ideas. It's a large group. It's too big to play. Your group I, ha- board I have an interesting. I have an interesting book that, about live action role playing games, the kind where you sit together and talk. And I do have one where each person's a member of the president's cabinet, but that only covers eight people. It'd be interesting if I could find one for fifteen or twenty. So if you have something like that, uh, let us know because I'm I'm really intrigued with it. Period. Yeah. Same here. Okay. The next question is from Mark Aldrich, and he says, "I have no doubt that both you and Tom are generous gamers." Uh, I'm willing to bet that despite your anti-Euro game sentiments and Tom's anti-war game talk, to say you hated any genre would be a, a fallacy. <laughs> well, anyway. That being said, as far as the show is concerned, Tom comes off as being more willing to play war games oh, than you are to play Euro games. Oh, hang stop, on, hang stop, on. stop. No, we yeah. got to stop right there. Tom, how many war games have you played with me? How many, as compared to how many Euro games have I played with well, you? Well, look, I'm just going to I'm just gonna say that. That, that, that I, is wrong. I'm going to agree that that's wrong, too. I... I just Tom I, won't play a war game. I don't really like war games. I I play light war games. Light meaning he played House Divided and walked away from it because he said it was too too restrictive in what he could do and everything else. So no, we didn't walk away from it. You, you what I mean what I mean away. is you walked away after the game was over saying that you just oh. didn't, you didn't like it. I I just don't really want to play them. But I'll play some. I'll play Seven Ages, which could be considered a war game. I'll play light war games. But We even tried to play Paths of Glory once. But Joe, Joe plays more minutes. Euro games than I play war games. About what, half an hour into Paths of Glory, we quit because we just didn't want to play because you didn't want to have to. It, just, it was just too comprehensive Anyway, for you. So going back to Joe, <laughs> he, they know that you like Euro games with heavy conflict, but he wants to know which Euro game is your guiltiest pleasure. <sighs> There has to be one game that you like that doesn't fit the mold of the on the air Joe Stedman. Some fluffy let's make friends Euro games. <laughs> Out with it. Oh my. I thought about this question for a few minutes and I you know the only one I could think of, maybe you can Tom, you've played a lot of games with me. Only the only one that came to my mind right away was uh Fearsome Floors. I like Fearsome Floors. Would you count that as fluffy let's make friends game? Yeah, but you you could justify it by saying that. People are getting killed there, by the I mean, monster. There you go. Well, I don't know, Tom. Could you? Because I, I, the first thing I thought of when I first read the question, I was like, "Oh, I like Age of Steam, Tigers and Euphrates." Then I was like, "Oh, wait, he says fluffy Euro games." So what is it? What is an example of a fluffy Euro game? So I know Joe it's... likes Power Grid and Union Pacific, but I don't know that they're they're not like fluffy like. I like Union Pacific, but games. not enough to. Joe well, likes like party Union. games a lot, but I like party those games. aren't Euro games. But I always try to break party games. <laughs> yeah, he does. Uh, All right. Well, sorry. I like. Mark. I don't. I can't stand Settlers of Catan, but I. I like Settlers of. I like Settlers of Canaan. Okay. I get. There you go. Yeah. Okay. We'll say Settlers of Canaan, and which go. brings us into our next question by Robert Carroll. Let me read this one here. It says, uh, "Seeing that you two are involved in mission work, what are your thoughts, positive or negative, or other, about games with religious themes, particularly uh, Redemption, the card game, The Journeys of Paul, Ark of the Covenant, and any other games that we can think of?" And right away, well, before we even answer the questions, I thought of a couple were, you know, Settlers of Canaan. Um, uh, what was the other one I thought of? I thought of another one. Well, let's just, the three that he mentioned, Redemption, the card game, I have not played it, however. I do have it. I have heard only good things about it. It's been out almost as long as Magic Gathering. It still has a strong following, which must mean that the game has some merit to it. Right. I have glanced at the rules, looked at the cards. It looks very interesting. The cards are high quality. It's just that it, it takes a lot for me to get me to play a collectible card game nowadays. Same here. Uh, the Journeys of Paul, I saw it, I had it explained to me at Origins, uh, it didn't catch my interest too much, but you never know, I might play it. But I was actually going to pick it up, but I went back to pick it up and he was all sold out. I'm not sure Cactus Games will give it to me because they, I do not <laughs> like Solomon's Temple. Solomon's Temple he didn't mention, but that game is horrible. Yeah, it's one of the worst games of all time. But uh, here we are, we're nitpicking at the games. I think he's at, the root of his question though is what do we think about religious themed games oh and real quick the Ark of the Covenant he mentioned I like the Ark of the Covenant I like the Ark of the Covenant but I will admit as much as anyone that it's just Carcassonne and they're sticking a Bible a Bible it's tacked on it, it's very very tacked on but the thing that as my wife and I have Ark of the Covenant and it's the only Carcassonne variation that I even halfway like and the reason I like it is because they got rid of the fielder and they put sheep and wolves and I just think that makes it that much more fun I don't. That's the main problem I have with Carcassonne is that stinking farmer or that whatever you call him who basically is the only reason that you win or lose a game. Is who have you played Carcassonne in the city? No. 
I really think you would like it as compared to the other two. There's no farmers in it. But anyway. Anyway. So anyway, back to the root of the question. You know, what do you think about uh, games with a religious theme? I think, uh, personally, I think it's a great thing. I wish there was more. I wish there was more high quality. I wish that they would stop putting out shoddy shoddy component Here's our our Christian rant. I'm going to do with Tom. I don't like it when Christian companies put out a horrible product and tack a Christian theme onto it, and it just damages the name of Christ, in my opinion. You got these... This includes books and movies. Books and low-budget Christian movies. If you're going to make a movie, then save up. Instead of making ten low-budget Christian movies, save up your money and make one good Christian movie. That's just, you know... All right, but and I feel the same way about games. I do... I have read the rules to an excellent uh, Christian game concerning the Twelve Disciples. It will certainly bring up some theological debate, but it's a very interesting one. I know it's it's in prototype form, and I know that there are people thinking of publishing it, um, but we'll just have to wait and see. We also, we, we've also played a, a Jewish game. We played a Muslim game, didn't we? Yeah, we did play a Muslim game. <laughs> uh, so from Mecca to Medina. Mecca to Medina, right. But I, we didn't think awfully highly of that game. It was kind of like a... The game itself wasn't that fun. Yeah. But anyway, back to the, the, the like. I think Tom and I both agree we'd like to see more religious games out there. We're Christians. Why would we not to have want to have more Christian games? All right. The next question is for Joe, and it's from Shanna, and they say that Joe, in the last episode, you were talking about a war game that you said many people did not enjoy because they felt the play of the two sides was too scripted. You said that that to you that was fun. Assuming that scripted means both players know what actions each player is going to take on his turn during the game, I want to know how that's fun. It would seem to me that simply replaying historical events or the same sequence of events in every game would not only kill replayability, but would also remove any sense of discovery or strategy from the game. What is it about a game with a scripted reputation that you enjoy where others do not? I can understand how adhering to historical accuracy is educational, but simply showing the VCR tape of a conflict doesn't sound that entertaining to me. Mm -hmm. Although, I would assume that seeing it the first time would be entertaining. Okay, well, let me, okay. Let me, just like a movie. All right, let me sentence. let me answer. Oh, let me answer because this is, I think, me and other even other war gamers will disagree on this. Not all. I think there's a large group that would follow what I say here. But to me, they follow Joe. They do not, <laughs> followers of Joe. No, not really. The Joe, the Joe faction. The Joe faction. But uh, no, to me, a, a simulation is a game. And I, I'm not going to get into simulation. What a simulation. To me, a good war game is a game that where I can watch history unfold before me and then I can make small decisions or I can try different tactics that will give us a different outcome than what historically happened. Now, when it, to me, it's just to see, can I do as well as Patton did? Can I do as well as Piper did as he pushed through the Battle of the Bulge? I want to see how far I can penetrate into the Americans' defensive lines before I'm stopped. I know I'm going to get stopped, but I want to see how far I can do Then I want to look and see how it compares to historically and say, look, if I was a World War II German commander, I would have did better than he did. You know, what, it just, It's just kind of fun to, for me. I just like history. That's what I like to see. Now, when I say that a game is too scripted, there are some games that... Like what the game that she's talking about is Barbarossa to Berlin, and the reason I said that game was too scripted is because it's a card-driven game, and you the, the cards that you play and the way the game unfolds is basically the same every time. And there's not as much room for um, variation as in a lot of other games because I don't know. I mean, although I I, I can't even take that back because there is lots of room for variation in that game, and I guess I don't know. I, I like that. But I, I I do I do like something I know Joe doesn't like. I don't mind. The what if scenarios in a game, where I say, "What if I decided to um, take half my force out of Italy and go and put them into Normandy?" It, overall, game changing, war war changing decisions. Well, that's there's that's a whole different scope. That's just the uh, you know historical fiction games and things like. There's one of my. But I'm not even talking about historical fiction. I'm saying the a capability of doing that in a normal game. I like to say like. All of, all of a sudden, you are Joseph Stalin, all, or you are Adolf Hitler, or you are Winston Churchill. What would you do differently and, and try it and see how it plays out with historical situations still set up to where... And it some would, games simply don't allow that. Oh, well, of course not. And that's what would be an overscripted game. But even, even, Well, no, no, not even overscripted. You you would say that, would you like to play a game where it allowed England to turn on the French? No. Okay, see, but that, that's what I'm saying. Unless I was going into the game knowing that. <laughs> you know, that would, who doesn't like attacking the French? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. See, I, bad example. All right, here's another war game question for Joe from David Stanaway. He says, "Have you played any of the Con Sim games on Korea? There are a few out there." So that's the first question. 
I, I have played a few of them, and I actually own a few of them. But they're all from. They're all. If you re, if you if you keep reading this question, um, all of the games I've played are from the actual Korean War period, and they're just simulations of of re- reacting to Chosin campaign or the whole war of Korea. There, there's some good games out there, and I think the Korean War is one of the over is one of the games that one of the theaters or one of the battles or wars. I'm sorry that hasn't been gamed as much as it probably could. And there's some really interesting stuff that happened during that war. So then he follows it up by saying, are there any theoretical contemporary games that you think fairly accurately simulate the current forces in play? Mm, see, I thought about this, and I even did a little research, and I couldn't find anything. So here's a call to war gamers and grog nerds out there. Tell me, because I would be interested in this, because I think a modern contemporary war game based on a, a modern scenario of what would happen in Korea, if a conventional war, what does it happen? would be very interesting, because it would be almost like, uh, it would almost be like World War II Eastern Front, because you have the smaller more uh, advanced, more technology army taking on the hordes of the Russians instead of maybe the North Koreans. I'd be interested to play a game like that. Uh, I would feel slightly uncomfortable. You know, it's like the when you play that Monsters Ravage America and there's a, the, you put yourself on the map. And if, if the, you know, you, you find an America where you are. If, if you're playing in America, which we don't, but... If you put where you are, and if the monster kills you, then you die. Well, in that game, it's kind of funny. I'm not sure I'd want to play a Korean War <laughs> well, game. Why? Because we're only uh, we're only 11 miles as a bird flies from the DMZ. Is that yeah. Right? Well, <laughs> but you know, I, I don't think about that kind of. We're you know, the Korean mentality over here is no one even talks about it. No one even cares. It's just it's just everyday life. It's been this way for 50 years. You know, we often joke that if, if there's a nuclear war, we won't even care because it's gonna, they're going to shoot the nuclear bombs right over us because we're too close to the North Koreans. <laughs> Yeah, but we'll die the old-fashioned way with regular tanks and bombs. All right, so those are the questions that people sent in. If you want to send us in some questions, then we will gladly answer them. Send some questions in for Tom. And before we go any farther, we just have a, a quick word from another another um, podcast. And um, so here you go. Here we go. Hi, I'm Paul Tevis. Do you love board games? I'm sure you do, because otherwise, why would you be listening to the Dice Tower? Well, if you like board games, you should check out my podcast, Have Games, Will Travel. It comes out twice a week, and on the Friday edition of the show, I talk about board games. I don't have nearly the depth of experience that Tom and Joe have, but I like to think that I bring a different perspective to the board gaming arena. Not only that, but on the Tuesday edition of the show, I talk about role-playing games. So if you're like me and have a foot in both worlds, you should definitely check it out. You can find it at havegameswilltravel.libsyn, that's L-I-B-S-Y-N, dot com. I know that Tom listens to the show, and I don't know about Joe, but a friend of mine's teaching me ASL, so Joe better watch out. So, if you're interested in another perspective on board games, or you want to know more about where role-playing is headed, come on over to Have Games Will Travel. See you there. You're listening to The Dice Tower at www.thedicetower.com with Tom Vassell and Joe Stedman. All right, so that's Paul. Paul's actually a very very, uh, well... Well, what? written author when I read him on the internet and I do I have listened to several of his shows and he he has a very calming good voice and yeah I was just he, he sounds better than we do maybe yeah. we, why'd you put his his, blah, his blurb on us it's kind of someone's going to jump shit <laughs> well, actually can, there's, there's not enough uh, can blur, to both. There, there's not enough out there because between you know there's ours and his and that's about it right <laughs> no because we talked about one last week in the UK oh that's right there's the and, one in the UK and then and there's I think I think we're going to do a there's we're, Mark. We're gonna do a crossover with Mark Johnson. Mark Johnson, and, that's a good and, one. And you never know who else we might. That, do that's that's with. all there is, right? No. Okay. Well, this so, is all. That's all I'm caring about. Here's some questions that we pulled off Board Game Geek because we never get enough from the people. So these are. We're gonna go through these a little bit quicker than normal, but they're they're pretty simple. And Joe has had no prior experience with this. But <laughs> this is like a new feature of the show. Just to pop the question on Joe. See what he says. Okay. Well, the first one is a yes or no question, so it's pretty easy. All right. Yes or no? A yes. Okay. <laughs> What's the question? The question is, is it poor form to concede in a two-player game? Yes. Is there no possible reason to do it? it well, I, I take that let's back. Say, let's say you're playing a war no, game. No, no. And if, you, it's a, if it's a war game, I'll never concede. I'll fight to the bitter end. If it's a Euro game, I'll concede as soon as I know I can't win. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a... Because that's a kingmaker situation. I don't think it's a poor game if... Oh, is it two-player? Yeah, two-player. Okay, two player. there's no, no kingmakers in two-player. Two player. In, in, in a two-player game, I never have a problem with someone conceding. If both players agree that that person cannot win. I think that's very relevant, and, and they and and if they 
feel that the time that they spend finishing up these events well, if you will best be played or another, another game, a different game. Yeah. Well, well, the war game, or except you know, like what I was talking about earlier, you you can do that because then it defeats that so you want to see how good you're doing. And if the other player just quits, that's one problem I have. One, one time I was beating a guy uh, in Bitter Woods, and I was kick, I was just really doing good, and I had penetrated really really far, and I wanted to see how far I get. And then halfway through the game, he said, "You know, you're just winning. There's no way I can win. Let's just quit." And I was like, "But I want to see if I can make it to the the the, the river, man. I want to see if I can cross the river." He was like, "No, nah, just don't worry about it." And it, that really irritated me, and I probably will never play the game with this guy again if I see him. <laughs> I, I, it was at Origins, and it's not. There's two different guys. I played one game with Skip Franklin when something similar happened, and Skip was cool about it. Skip's like, "Yeah, let's play, let's play." And I, I felt guilty because I was because he had made a mistake, and we didn't know the rules well, and so I had penetrated too far into his defenses. And but we we called that game mutually. But the other guy, he just quit, and it was like, "Man, what a poor sport." And I don't want to. If I see that he's a bald guy, I'm not. I'm all, right, gonna, all right, all right, all right. Okay. okay. <laughs> the next question is one of the Everybody most. Take me off. Shut up. <laughs> One of the most useless things I can think of is a shrink wrap game. Tear them open and play them to tatters. What's your opinion? Disagree. I agree. We just, do we, do we, do you agree, no with, you agree with me or agree with the question? I agree that there's no reason to keep a shrink wrap game. Uh, see, I disagree. I probably got. Games are meant to be played. I got, yeah. at, least, I got at least 20 games in my. No, I got more than that. I probably got 75 games or maybe 50 games that are shrink wrapped. Look, I feel guilty as it is because right now in my house. There are four shrink wrap games from out of the box games. I got them yesterday. I have never waited this long to open a shrink wrap <laughs> game before. I'm, I got it. You're swamped. I'm, I'm swamped. I'm Look, running an instance, auction at our school. I've, I've got L two, L two Streets of Stalingrad monster game in the shrink wrap. But I would have Why in the world would I open it if I'm not going to play it? The, 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 the resale value just drops tremendously. I don't even know if I'll ever play it. I don't know. I just Besides, it's just like a nap cool about, it's just cool to look up on my shelf and see games in shrink wrap, especially when you have old I had up front in shrink wrap forever. And then finally one day I just opened it. I didn't care. I had I had to see it. And then I was disappointed because the rules were horrible. Wow. But the game's awesome. Okay. Here's the next one. Have you ever printed out a print and play game and played it with your group? A print and play game? Yeah, print and play games means you go on the internet, you print off all the the components, you print them out, make them yourself. Now, this and is play different. The game. This is different from the cheapskates who rip off games and do their own copies, right? Yes, this is this that is, just ticks me off. Okay, this is this is someone who actually the unethical people out there. Okay, anyway, I'm not asking about that. This is someone who actually has a game on the internet, and I, I get requests for these every once in a while where someone says, I have a print and play game, they have all the components, you print them out in different sheets, you cut out the cards, you do all that, and you make your own game, and it's free except for the time. And the effort you put into it. And I gotta be, I gotta be honest. No. Okay. And I'm gonna agree. No. And it's not because I think print and play games are bad. In fact, some of them look interesting. It's just because there's so many good commercial games with so many good components. Yeah. I don't. The well, time, the time and effort you put into cutting out and doing all that stuff, you could have just spent seven night or spent. I could have cut someone's lawn and you know. <laughs> cut someone's lawn and. Well, there's well, no lawns in Korea. I'm just saying in America. <laughs> Go make some money somewhere and buy a game yeah. in the same amount of time. It's it's. But you know, then again, the multi man publishing just gave out a free game, and that's different. It was a free game that you print out. Yeah, so that a lot of know. these print and play games are free. I know, but it was different because it was uh, actually I haven't done it, so maybe I should just be quiet. I heard <laughs> I heard about it. I've never done it. <laughs> okay, it could be a print and play. I don't know. Last week we talked about what movie would we like to see become a board game. This time the question is, what board game would you like? Would you like to see adapted to a movie? A board game changed to a movie. So while Joe's thinking about that, mine is easy. Stool of Ages. Come on, I want to see, I want to see uh, Genghis Khan fighting Robin Hood fighting. Uh, on really warped land. <laughs> <laughs> fighting different people across. It, it, that just sounds like it'd make a premise for a cool movie. Hmm. Although it'd probably be a cheesy movie. What board game I like to see into a movie? How about uh, Sniper? That'd be a good. Well, there's already been a Sniper movie, but not not like a good World War II one. Um, I can say the Unspeakable game, but I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that one was made into a movie called Saving Private Ryan, right? <laughs> no, that was not about. Well, yeah. Whatever. Or Band of Brothers. There you go. Okay. Uh, I don't know. That's a good one. How about Lowen Hurts? <laughs> <laughs> there's plenty. Oh, plenty. Uh, Kremlin. Kremlin would be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The next one is your favorite game that takes at least five hours to play. I know mine easy. Why Joe's thinking that one? Or do you already know? No, that's like that's more than half of my collection. Okay. Well, why Joe's thinking? Well, five hours or more. All right, hold on. Well, why Joe's thinking of it? Mine's easy. It's seven ages. Seven ages takes a really long time to build up a civilization and see it fall, and build up another civilization and see it fall. And I just, I really enjoy the game. I don't get to play it very often because it does take around seven or eight hours. And but man, it's just it's such a fulfilling game. As you go throughout history, watching civilizations rise and fall. Now, I, I was reading about Seven Ages by a well-known reviewer, 
that's no. not you, and he was really slamming again. Yeah, well, he said it was broken. I'm gonna have to say on record that he's wrong. In, in case you come across CF is a CF. Anyway, go ahead and say your. <laughs> next okay, one. I, I guess for me, face to face diplomacy would be my favorite. Okay, because you know that's more than five hours. I don't that's care. That's true. But, and, but other than that, it'd be all the monster games. A Joe Yost monster game, probably, because they just they just in, for some reason I just get. All right. I just see it and I'm just like, oh, like Homer Simpson. Oh. Our, our last <laughs> random question is, what was your longest game session? Now, I'm just going to guess right now that it was Origins for you. Yeah, well, that's that's probably. Well, I don't know. There's quite a few ones. Yeah, Origins all weekend on one game, but that doesn't really count because I would the mon- the, the, the the way a monster game works at or at a game convention is no, that, no, no game session means. I I think it's. Playing a game, then playing another game, then playing another game. Oh well, four days straight without. Well, yeah, like basically four days straight with very, four days straight with very little sleep. Yeah, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna say that I I actually like my sleep. Although at the last Origins, in 2005, I, I really did didn't sleep that much. I didn't sleep at all one night, and I paid for it. Yeah, I, I saw him the next day. He, he he looked a little dead. Me, me and Gary and me, Gary Christensen and Joe Yost did up all night playing. I don't uh, think Joe enjoyed Panzer, his last day at Origin so much. <laughs> playing Panzer Group Guderian, and I tell you what, Gary Christensen's normally a pretty nice guy, but I tell you what, about four in the morning, all three of us were just like. <laughs> all right. So those are our questions for this week, and we'll see if we can have different ones in the future. But right now, what we got is uh, what's next? Our games played recently. Okay, for me, the only games I played this week that were of any kind of interest, um, it's just been a, such a busy week. We're running a live auction at our school, and I'm getting ready for that. I'm in charge of it, and it's it's. I, I bit off a really big piece of steak doing that one, but <laughs> we're just going to finish it through. Only a couple more days. But meanwhile, I also agreed to chaperone the junior high lock-in. And so all the games I played this week were at the junior high lock-in. I took in about 50 games from... They're all simple games like Pig Pile and um, Cloud Nine, and half the kids played the games. The other half fell asleep. They set they set up a hero scape and played that. They played uh, uh, um, Weapons and Warriors and just shoot little orange balls around the cafeteria. But the coolest thing we did was we played a forty-five player game of Werewolf. There were five <laughs> werewolves. There were two were rats. There was a hunter. And it, it was really fun because the kids sat us around tables in a huge circle. I stood in the middle, and every time the night was over, uh, one of the other chaperones would hit the cymbals with the drumstick, and it just that dissonance woke up the kids. It was just, it was just really cool, and, and there was a good feel because it was at three in the morning, and the kids were just then getting a little sleepy. In fact, one of the uh, villagers fell asleep. Until they were accused of being a werewolf and killed, and I still don't know why the other kids didn't realize if they were sleeping, they probably weren't a werewolf. <laughs> but that was fun for me. Although I have learned that you don't play too many board games at three in the morning with with teenagers. It was just after we had played a whole bunch of running around games, and they were just dead. I mean, they some of them played, some of them fell asleep, and, and it was kind of a fizzly way out. But it was still nice that I had fifty different games for them to play. So that was my games I played. How about you, Joe? Well, let's say I played. You can't un- mention some of the games. Yes, I, I I I played the unspeakable game and uh, the second edition or the the child's version of the unspeakable game, and then uh, I played ambush, and uh, I played combat soldiers, battle of the bulge. I played elk fest, elk elk fest. How do you how do you say that one? Elk fest. I think. Elk fest. That's that silly game where you flick the. Yeah, but there seems to be a very loud contingent of people who are pushing for elk fest to be at the World Board Gaming Champions this coming year. <laughs> You're kidding, right? No, I'm not kidding. Oh man, go, go look it up. In fact, Elkfest is just a really silly game where you each got a moose and you're trying to move it from one iceberg to another iceberg, and you you're flicking little pieces of ice around, but they're you know pieces of wood, but whatever. Um, I played a PC game, a course on Pocket, which isn't really a board game, so I guess that doesn't count. And then I played my play. T- then I played my own game. My wife and I played that quite a bit, and uh, it's still not ready for. The rules haven't been typed out yet. I've got a couple people. Thank you for asking for the rules. I'll go ahead and send them to you once I get them. Once I get them typed out, but uh, we're still working out some kinks. But it looks it looks like it's got good potential. Okay, and now that's, it's that's called Happy Acres. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for our hot game of the month, and I don't have a sound effect for that. But although I am getting one ready, so hot game of the month. It's just a game of in the past month that we played a lot more than other games. It's a game we like a lot. It's on our. It's not our. Maybe it might not be in our top ten list. Although I think Joe's is, but. It's just a game we played a lot lately and a game we like. It's mine, yeah. mine is the one I mentioned last week as a review, which is Runebound. I've just gotten rather enamored with the game. 
I'm having a good time running through my character, growing my character. I like playing it um, by myself. I found it was too easy because I could take too many pauses. I could rest and heal up before every battle. But then I, there was an alternate rules in the book where there's a doom track where you can slowly, you know, the enemies get harder. And, and you can also have random encounters. And that made it hard. And I got destroyed. So, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of solitaire games, but this one's starting to, to attract me a little. Hmm. Although I do like playing it with two or three people better. But that's been my hot game of the month, Runebound. My hot game of the month was uh, Diplomacy. And just because I've, I've been playing it quite a bit lately, not only in my classroom, um, but I've been playing an internet game. And then that game just ended. And then I'm playing a new game. I started up on Consum World over with uh, with Walt. Walt and some of the guys. And so that's going to be fun. Although I'm a little bit confused in the whole game because we're we're doing part of the game on Consum World and Walt's got his blog. And this kind of con- the whole thing is kind of confusing to me. So hopefully it'll all work the kinks. Walt will work all the kinks out. But uh, Diplomacy is just a great game. I'm sorry. A great evil game. Right. Okay, so that's our hot game for the month, which brings us up to the final part of our show, which is our top ten list. And actually, a question a question was regarding our top ten list was where Hans Kischel asked me. He actually asked two questions, but I, I currently, Hans, I, I deleted one of your questions since um, it was about the game that Joe can't mention. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to it <laughs> next week. But he asked if I had ever tried the game Yinch or any of the other games in the GIF series, which is spelled G-I-P-F. And if I'm pronouncing it wrong, it's because it's one of the strangest Gipf. games for a, a game ever. And so he asked me about that. And then someone else wrote me a letter and told me how Checkers was not solved, and he showed me several sources on the Internet. My response to the, the fact that Checkers is not solved is, first of all, the sources that he sent me were fairly old, 97, which is eight years ago. Secondly, if Checkers is not solved, at least Optimal Play has been provided, just like I think Optimal Play has been provided in another game, which we're going to talk about. Puerto Rico? No, no, no. In our, well, Puerto Rico, yes, but <laughs> another game in our list. Here's right. our list for today is our top ten abstract strategy games. Now, we say abstract strategy games, and so that's a pretty big category. So Tom and I had to talk for a few minutes, try to round it down so we could decide that we both agreed on what exactly an abstract strategy game was because... I'm still not sure that one of the games in Joe's list is abstract strategy. We'll get to it because I think that's I, I don't think there's strategy. Well, this is this this is kind of the reason we we had the whole thing of making ten game categories or making ca- game definitive game categories because there's a few games that are hard to define. And really, if you're just saying abstract strategy, I would say a lot of the games that and I, I know people are not going to like me for saying this, but I'm going to say a lot of the games out there that are Euro games to me are abstract strategy games with a tacked on theme. So what I did was I just decided that I would only choose games that were either no theme at all. Or the theme was just totally irrelevant. So and and uh, and that's what I did too. I, I disagree with Joe's basic premise, but I, I I picked games that had no theme, or it there was obviously the theme was there on top of an abstract strategy game, and it's hard to explain. But I just picked games that I know are abstract strategy games. So there. <laughs> so I don't. There's, there's no actual criteria. Maybe Tom, can because Tom us. said that's all there that matters. Well, <laughs> anyway, Joe, I actually have changed my. My number ten game since. What is that game? Yeah, so did mine. What was that one called? Um, that one with the, the the rainbow game, whatever. I really the rainbow the, game. The one I cheated on that I che- I beat you in. Oh, that's called a Phoenix. That's my ten number ten. So well, okay. well, you just gave it away, now, man. You, you ruined it. I ruined the show. Cut okay. that part out, Tom. Wait, we do it live. Oh man. All right. And no. now it's time for the weekly top ten list. Okay, well, it's time for our top ten list. Weekly top ten list. Like he just said. (laughs) Number ten. Okay, now, Joe, you can talk about your number ten game. All right. My number ten game is Phoenix. Now, Phoenix is uh, a very abstract game. It doesn't have any attempt at uh, anything. And all the game is, um, who makes Phoenix, Tom? I guess I should pull this up. Phoenix was made by uh, Descartes. They're games for two players. Uh, they're no longer in businesses, if I recall correctly. I think Cafe Games sells their games in America. Okay. Um, and you you know Cafe Games, Morgan and Ron, yeah. who, who suckered you into playing at Euro Games. Yeah, Morgan, man, I'm going to get that guy. But anyway, 
uh, Phoenix is a, a very simple game, and what it is is this two-player game, and you put a, uh, a a series of blocks in between you and your opponent that are different colors, and then in front of each of you, you have a series of pawns that are the same amount of uh, as the number of blocks in the middle, and it's all randomized. And then you have cards in your hand, and you just play cards trying to make your series of pawns correspond with the blocks in the middle. And then each you can also play cards that will affect your opponent's pawns, and you can play cards that really you know uh, that change the order of the block. And so the first person to get all his blocks in order wins. And I just, I'd like it. I'll probably end up trading it from Tom because I don't think Tom likes it that much. Nah, it's too random for me. And, and yeah, I'll trade it with you, Joe, if you find it. A, a it's two, a two-player it's game just, that I think my wife and I would enjoy. Yeah, it's okay. Laura and I had a good time, but it, it just was too random. It's because I cheated the first time we played, and ever yeah, since that, then, that you, doesn't really. You didn't well, like. we'll see. We, we, the first time we played, Tom set it up, and he was doing this classic thing that he does. Tom's the kind of game player that, if you're a good friend of his like I am, when he plays a game with you, he only halfway pays attention, and he reads board game rules. Yeah, well, I was reading the rules to make sure we were playing it right. No, you're reading the rules to a totally different game. Oh, well, maybe. And so Tom's over here looking at the rules, and so I'm just over there rearranging all the blocks, his blocks, my blocks, the pawns. And then I looked down after like a minute, and I was like, all right, Tom, I think I won. <laughs> Tom's like, wow. <laughs> I wasn't very impressed with the game at that point. It was, it's too fast. <laughs> well, like, you didn't get to pay attention. I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to cheat. Okay. So you, you just learned something about our characters. All right. <laughs> My number 10 game is King's Court. King's Court is not in production anymore. It's, it's, it's an actually an older game from the 80s. I, I like it, and it's kind of weird because I'm not a big fan of checkers at all. But this game is basically a game of super checkers, where there is 64 squares, just like in checkers, and the middle 16 squares, 4x4 four four grid, is the king's court. And in the, at some point in the game, you need to move one of your checkers into that court. Once your checker's into the court, you, can, you must always have one checker in the court. If all your checkers in the court are gone, then the game is over. And all your checkers have super checker ability, which means they can jump multiple times, like in Chinese chess. I mean, yeah, Chinese chess. No, Chinese checkers. I'm sorry. Like in Chinese checkers. And they can jump over their own pieces. It has really nice pieces. It, it, it might be some nostalgic things that I liked about it. And, again, it's probably fairly solvable just like checkers is. But I liked it a lot. Huh. And let me just pause right here and briefly say that there's a lot of games that are public domain games. And maybe people will be surprised that they're not on the list. One of them is on Joe's. But Backgammon is not on my list. Neither is checkers. Neither is Othello. And... Neither is how's, Chinese checkers. How's Othello public domain? Well, maybe Othello's not public domain. I think it's, Par- Othello- Par- it's Parker Brothers or something, isn't it? Yeah, but the game that it comes from, Reversi, is is public domain. Okay. Othello is just one brand, brand name of it. Okay, so that's my number 10 game, is King's Court. Number 9. All right. My number 9 is a game that Tom, I think, will say is not even a... A st- a abstract strategy. Well, game. I'll give you abstract. I just don't think your strategy. But go ahead and say it. Uh, it's liars dice, and it's just a simple game where you. It's about bluffing. It's other name. They also reproduced it and called it bluff. And uh, you just roll dice and you try to guess how many dice of a certain number that other players have. And it's it's to me a real fun abstract game. And there's no theme involved. It's just pure abstract. So I don't know how it wouldn't be abstract. Yeah, but then you could say poker is abstract, hearts is abstract, spades is abstract. Those I don't are, know. Those are public domain, so I didn't count them. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? You definitely have another public domain game on your list. Well, that, that's <laughs> your number point. seven game is public domain for sure. Well, so is my number one. Okay. So anyway, so anyway, liars dice, and uh, if you don't think that it's abstract strategy, then well, you're wrong. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> my number nine game is Blocus. Blocus is a game where you simply have different shapes that look like the shapes from the video game Tetris and other shapes that are made up of five squares or, or four squares or three squares or two squares, and you just place them on the board. It has to be diagonal to one of your pieces, and if once you can't place pieces anymore, then you're out, and you count all the squares left of the pieces that you weren't able to put on, and the person who put on the most squares is the winner. And Blocus is, is a fun game. I really enjoy it. Its problems is it's not good for three players. It only works for two and four. And there's another game that's better than it, which we're going to talk about later. Right. But Blocus still is a good game. If you have a chance to get a copy of it for a cheap price, I, I think I'd pick it up because it does look nice, too. So my number nine game is Blocus. Number eight. All right. My number eight is another game that Tom might disagree with me on. Uh, I say my number eight game is Can't Stop. <sighs> no, I actually suggested Can't Stop as, as when I was making a list of games that we might pick. Can't Stop is, is, is more iffy, and, and I would actually pick it. I like Can't Stop. It's not my top ten, but 
See, when we, you know, Tom and I pick our games separately, but sometimes Tom thinks that I might need help. So he, he gave me a suggestion list, and I, I'd already picked my top ten, and I was laughing because there was a few games that he suggested that I actually picked. But, uh, yeah, I like Can't Stop. It's To me, it's it's push your luck. You know, see how far you can push it until it's too late. And then actually, you I, I taught a couple kids Can't Stop at that that locket I was just talking about. Right? Actually, I actually have a computer version of Can't Stop that I play sometimes when I'm bored. Can you play against a computer player? Yeah, you play against all computer players. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So okay. Can't Stop. My number eight game is Tamsk. It's one of the gift series by uh, Chris Br- Blum, Brum, Brum, oh, just by somebody. Um, and Tamsk... The game itself is really not that interesting of a game. It's an okay game. You're trying to move your pieces around, and once you move your pieces into places that they no longer can move, then then you're stuck. But what's really cool about it is the fact that the pieces are timers. Oh, And you have to flip the timer before you move. So this is a game you picked purely because of the bits? No, I picked because of the mechanism of the timer running out. It's Sometimes I don't like abstract games because you can sit there and stare at the board for where it seems like time stands still. But in Tamsk, it can't happen because your timer's running out. And if your timer ever runs out, then your piece is dead. And so Tamsk is my number eight game for that reason alone. The game itself is pretty good. When you combine it with the timers, I like it a lot. Unfortunately, I don't own any of the Gift series at all. Not a single one of them. I don't know why. I didn't get on in the ground floor. Now that the last one's just been released, um, maybe they'll sell the whole set together. So anyway, my number eight game is Tamsk. Number seven. You know, I just changed. I had number seven game, but I. Oh, sorry. I had a number seven game, and I changed it only because, as much as I like number seven for me was go. And as much as I like go, uh, I just never have been able to master it, or not even master it. I'm, I'm sorry, even comprehend it is a better word. <laughs> and I, I think it's fun and great. Maybe after I get some more lessons from uh, whatever the term is for a master at go, and then my our friend Bob, he knew all the terminology and all this. Yeah, he taught both of us how to play on on a smaller board. I think it was sixteen by sixteen. Not even that. He had like an eight by eight. Well, a little dinky thing. You know, I mean, I understand the game how it works, but it's just like I play it, and then all of a sudden, bam, I'm dead. Like, whoa, what happened? So I, I took it off my list because I just, ah, as much as I like the, as much as I want to like it, I just I can't get over the bubble. Go is fascinating, but to me, the game is work. Yeah, and a game that's work is just not a not... game. Well, anyway, go ahead and give your. your so real my my real number seven is Ricochet Robot, and if you can, if you say this is not abstract strategy, no, 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 I think Ricochet <laughs> Robot is abstract strategy. Ricochet Robot is really fun. Uh, it's Actually, a brain. I would say it's a puzzle more than a game. It's a brain burner, uh, definitely. In Ricochet Robot, you just have a uh, five robots that are on a on a board, and then you're just trying to figure out a way to bounce uh, a robot across the board, ricocheting at different angles, and all this to the goal. And it's. You basically flip a timer, and you know you, you look, and then if one, one person thinks they figured it out, you flip a timer, then everyone else tries to beat how many moves they said they can do it in. And I, I like it. My wife and I played it a few times together, and we, we own it. Ricochet Robot. My number seven game is Ingenious, which is by Rainer Knizia, and it's basically a dominoes. It's similar to dominoes where you place down pieces with different colors and different shapes, and every time you place a piece next to other pieces of the same color, you get points for however many it's next to. It has a bit of randomness from drawing tiles, but the end game scoring I like is because whatever color you have the least points in is your final score. So if I have 10 points in red, orange, and purple, but have three points in green, my final score is green. And it's a very fun, fast, abstract strategy game, and that's why I like it. And that's why Ingenious is my number seven game. Number six. All right, Tom. Number six is the same for us. So. Oh, yeah, that's right. We picked the same game. We picked the same game. We're gonna keep. We're gonna keep uh, hyping this game. It's really, really good. And I, I, I think that when I go to Origins next time, next, next, next year, I think it's gonna be there, just because it's such a good game. And the name of the game is Gem Below. Gem Below is a Korean abstract strategy game that is uh, basically Blokus but better. Yeah, it's Blokus, but it's a hexagonal board. Mm-hmm. Which allows six players to play, and the way the game's set up, three players can play, and there's almost no three-player abstract games. Oh, it's really well. It's just, it just shines with three players, and the pieces look really nice. They look like little jewels on the on the board. The only problem with Jumbo is that the box is huge, and it's huge, and it's a huge stop sign. It looks like you're carrying a stop sign around. <laughs> yeah, and so that's just a little bit difficult to work with. And it's also in Korea. And although I have seen that there's at least one store in California that picked up copies, I'm still waiting for a major distributor to pick it up. I mean, if you're a, if, I don't understand why one of these guys don't contact Jim Blow. They got a website even. Check. I'm telling you, it will sell. Even okay. a, even a private entrepreneur. If I had the capital, I would even think about doing it. I just don't have the money. Yeah. All right. So that's our number six game for both of us was Jim Blow. Number five. 
I'm going to skip my number five, let you talk about it later when it becomes your number two. Okay. My number five is a game called Pacru. Actually, it's a triple game, Pacru, Shakru, and um, another That's, one that, that rhymes with Akru. Is that like the three sons? And <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, basically each each Meshach. player has three or four arrow pieces on his board that has a... Uh, it's basically a grid, and each grid it looks like a sundial. And these arrow pieces, you're, on your turn, you move one one space, and you, you can turn it 45 degrees on your turn. And in the basic game, you're basically just moving your arrows around, trying to, every time you move an arrow, you leave a piece in the space that you move to, and you can never move into spaces that contain an opponent's piece of their color. So it's kind of an area control game, but I, it reminds me more of Tron, where you're driving your, your yeah. little motorcycle around trying not to die. That's the basic game in the in the Chakru. In the next version, they add more rules where you can do different things. You can jump depending on how much control you have in a different area. And the rules get a little bit more complicated, but it's still basically, in the, in the next two games, it's still the same thing. You're trying to keep your pieces alive and are moving around the board as long as possible. And I, I really enjoy it a lot. It's, it's one of the two games on my list that's brand new to me in the past two months. But Pacru... I, I highly recommend picking it up if you can. That's my number five game. I would say uh, it's pretty full, pretty cool. The Tron aspect. Yes. Number four. All right, I think I'll skip number four and let you talk about it later when it becomes your number one. Okay. <laughs> so my number four game is Da Vinci's Challenge. It's a game I just got a, a couple weeks ago, but I really like it. I, I even heard it sold at Toys R Us, so that's pretty neat. It's made by Briar Patch. Each player has two different kinds of pieces, an oval and a triangle. Uh, piles of ovals and triangles, and you're placing them on the board, trying to make patterns. And it's kind of like a advanced form of tic tac toe, where you're, if you get certain patterns, you get points, but you can also block your opponent's patterns. All you do in your turn is put down a piece. That's all. And it sounds really simple, but the, the way you make patterns and stuff, it's really neat. Um, the, it, I, I just really enjoy it. I, I don't really care anything about Da Vinci or whatever, but the the game itself is really interesting. So my number four game is Da Vinci's Challenge. Huh. Number three. I, can I finally talk about a game? Yes, you can. <laughs> Although you would disagree with me on this one again. I didn't disagree, but I uh, found some people on the internet who did disagree, right, and well, so I paused before putting it on my list. Right, I think my number three game is Zendo, and Zendo is purely abstract thinking. I don't know what else you would call a puzzle, and Zendo also is dedu- well. Okay, um, deduction is not going to be on my ten game on my ten category list. I'm sorry. But uh, in Zendo, all you simply do is you uh, you can use anything you want, but the game Zendo actually comes with ice houses, which are these, like cones, or not cones, but like little pyramids. And you uh, lay them in a configuration on a table, and then you make a rule about those the way they're set up. And then you write this rule down, or you have a card that says this rule on it. There's different variations of how you can play. And then all the other players are trying to guess what your rule is by asking you, Questions about the the configuration, and it's just a real that when you, the first time I played it, I just thought you know, this is really dumb. But then it's just started. It's like one of those games, that, like a game grenade, it just kind of does nothing for you. Then all of a sudden, boom, you, you like it, and I, I just really like Zendo. Okay, um, my number three game is Yinch. Yinch is by far my favorite of the Gift series. I like Othello and Reversi, whatever you might call the game, but it feels a little too simple for me. Yinch is a really cool game. You're moving rings around the board, and whenever you move a ring, you flip over all the pieces that the ring moves over. And it sounds really simple, and it is simple, but for me, it's just a very, very satisfying game. I think Joe owns this game. Yes, I do. My wife and I uh, play it a little bit, and it's, it's fun. It didn't make my top ten, but it, it is a fun game. It's definitely, in my opinion, the best of that series. It's definitely abstract strategy, though. <laughs> yes, um, and it, it, it's a lot of fun. If you can, if, if you only can get one game from that series, pick it up. I like Zertz, I like Devon, I like Tamsk, but Yinch is the best. I have not played Punked or Gif. Punked is the new one, which sounds like a TV show, but it does. All right, so that's my number three game is Yinch. Number two, <laughs> two. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, do your number two. I'm oh, sorry. This number, is one I don't like. All right, number two for me is called the Hive. And all Hive is is uh, you have hex, or hexagon pieces that have different bugs on them, and then you're trying to surround the, your opponent's queen bee. And you have different bugs that can do different capabilities, and it's just really, really fun. There's no board needed. You just use the pieces. And I don't know why Tom wouldn't like it. It's just too... Why, why don't you like it? I, I don't know. I just feel that it just feels very restrictive to me. 
<laughs> You're so free spirited, Tom. You got nothing can be restrictive <laughs> to you. I don't understand. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I just feel like it should have a theme. I think the bug theme is really cool, and yeah. it's not a bug theme. Anyway, it's abstract strategy. It, it, it is really a really fun game. I might give Hive another chance in the future, and we'll, we'll see. Okay, my number two game, which is Joe's number five game, is Play Blow. Play Blow is where you have three dimensional block figures, and you're trying to put them down on a board so that a chief piece that's moving around the outside of the board can't see them. Yeah, there's some kind of Navajo Indian stupid theme, but who cares? It's, it's abstract strategy all the way. It's basically how you can best position your three-dimensional blocks. And for me, that's just a really cool game. And I, obviously, Joe likes it, too. Yeah, it is It is fun. It's just fun to... to it's one of those games where line of sight matters. And if you're a, a war gamer, you know, line of sight's a common thing you use, especially in the game that I can't talk about. But uh, line of sight... So you have to actually hit your head down to the table like a miniatures game and look over and see if uh, you can see different things. That's kind of cool. And finally, number one... <laughs> Oh, sorry. Maybe we should ask him to redo that number one. This is like teasing it all the time. All right, my number one is the abstract strategy game of all abstract strategy games, chess. I mean, how can you not love chess? I grew up playing it. Everyone knows how to play it. There's whole people that devote their life to the game, and uh, it's it's the game of games for abstract strategy. I mean, come on. Well, I I just... <sighs> I don't dislike the game. I just feel that it's been... It's been studied to death. And if you play someone who's really good in chess and you're no good, you'll lose. Unfortunately, that, that argument is not going to hold too much water right now because almost every game that we've mentioned today is the same way, except for Liar's Dice and Can't Stop. But if you play someone better at Go or Gemblo or Pueblo or, Z- or, or Hive or Da Vinci's Challenge or Pacru or Ingenious or Tamsk or Yinch, the better person is always going to win, probably. Unless, of course, some outstanding luck thing occurs but um i don't know chess just got kind of boring for me i i I like i like uh nightmare chess but that's totally abstract and chaotic and random how are you how are you doing for time oh we're almost done good (laughs) my number one game which is joe's number four game is through the desert and through the desert has apparently a theme of camels in the desert and trying to touch oases and whatever it's like a bunch of garbage to theme the theme is, is you're just it, it's basically a simplified go where you're putting down your camels from different colors in as long of rows as possible while you're blocking off you're trying to take territory um, you're trying to get different pieces on the board that are different uh, point values there's some luck in the game but it's not much you're simply put down two camels on your turn and you can pick any colors you want and it's a game I'm I, I've I do fairly well at, which may affect how much I like it, but it's just, it's a simple game that has such depth, and it works incredibly well with four or five players. And so that's why it's my number one game, and I think that's why it's Joe's number four. Yeah, it, it is a good game. I, I, every time I play it, I just want to eat candy, so it's just, okay, how, can you, <laughs> how can you not like the fact of the pastel camels? It's so stinking manly. Manly? <laughs> Okay, see, now we, we've, we've crossed the line into just weirdness. All right, so that's our, our top ten abstract strategy games for episode 24. I'm sure that most of you would disagree with us on those, and that's fine. Send us your disagreements via email. Send us your entries. This is the last week for the contest for memoir. If you haven't entered yet, now is now is the time to do that. This is also your last, um, no, it's not last for anything else. Next week we should have some new themes. Next week we're gonna we're gonna do our categories of games, which I'm assuming right now, just off the top of my head, that there will be more than ten. So it might take up a, a decent amount of the show, but we'll see. Uh-huh. We'll read some of the best answers from our memoir contest, <laughs> and oh boy. and the rest of them we're gonna post on the oh internet. Oh boy, Joe, do you have anything of any interest to say? Because <laughs> apparently I'm uh, picking. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> I like to say hi to my son Joey. Hi, Joey. Oh, come on. Now I'm we're... using my celebrity status to say hi to my son. Okay. Well, we really thank you for listening. Check out our website. The... <laughs> well, I don't have to say all this stuff because the... It's already on the our blurb. Gonna say it. We, right. we paid that guy to do that. So here we go. Uh, th- this is Tom Vassell signing off. And I'm Joe Stedman. Goodbye. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to today's show. Tune in each week for a new episode and a new top ten list. 
If you have any questions for Tom or Joe, email them at thedicetower at gmail.com or check out the webpage, www.thedicetower.com. You've been listening to The Dice Tower. Well, what a show. It's really interesting sometimes listening to these, and I hear the questions being asked, and I say, huh, I know what I think about that. And usually my opinions haven't changed. Now, my opinions on the top ten list in this episode have really changed. I mean, I still like some of the abstract games I mentioned, but uh, once we did the show, I started playing more and more of them, and I play them quite a bit nowadays and use them a lot in teaching. And so that this is one of those – you could hear here at the beginning, I was starting to use games and teaching. I'm now very adamant about that, and I've taught it at several uh, teaching conventions on how to utilize games in the classroom. And I have a lot of fun doing that, and I still think that's a big deal. But I do think it's interesting how my opinions have mostly stayed the same. In this episode, you also heard our Lowenhurst vs. Domain debate, and this was the beginning of the board game Smackdown. Unfortunately, while those two games, they were just dying to be compared... It doesn't always work out as well as we want it to. I still like to do it. I think you can compare Candyland, Axis, and Allies if you want. But people like when they're fairly similar. So we still try to do that today, but it doesn't always have the same game versus game showdown. Although we, we certainly try to do so. You can hear it still, the, <laughs> the poor sound quality. I, I said in this episode that we were going to change the theme for the next show, and we, and we did. It's interesting, you know, sometimes you, you think about these different podcasts, and hosting is is a cost of a podcast for sure. And I'm so thankful that Fun Again Games lets us on their website, and that saves us that cost. But if you're trying to make yourself better, there's always things to buy, to buy the music. The announcer guy in this episode, I was paying him to, to do his things, and finding music and finding video clips. I'm trying to take my videos now to the next level and try to take our audio podcast to the next level, and we're always looking for new music and new stuff, and that costs money. And so we get money from the show, but I always end up putting a lot of it back into the show. And we try to make it better. And 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 it's fun to find the right fit. Finding that right musical theme, though, is tough. And I'm glad that Timothy Pinkham, you know, gave us, this, you know, composed us our own theme. I really like it. Now I'm trying to find a, a good theme for my top 100 list thing. But I, I think we've nailed one down that I like. But we'll see. But anyway, that's it for now. I'll see you guys next week. Until then, and even then, I'm Tom Vassell. Thanks for listening. For more information about this and other episodes of The Dice Tower, visit us at thedicetower.com. Next time, what one person would you like to play a game with? Find out what our contributors have to say. Also, more information about The Secret Santa 2010. Until next time, from all the gang at The Dice Tower, have fun gaming. Gaming.